NES Works episode 112 rises like a dragon sword. At this point in early 1989, I think we can safely say that the NES is firing on all cylinders. Now, every console ends up with games like Kung Fu Heroes, but only a truly groundbreaking platform ends up with a steady stream of releases on par with Ninja Gaiden. I've been dropping references and allusions to Ninja Gaiden since NES Works entered this new year, and for good reason. It was the big release for winter 1989. I admit that this is one of those cases where my own personal memories and experiences have become largely inextricable from my view of the bigger picture, so I don't expect a fully objective look back at this particular release. That being said, I'd hardly be speaking out of sync with the larger NES fanbase by enthusing about Ninja Gaiden. By this point, I think it's managed to secure a meaningful place for itself in history, enshrining itself as one of the console's best. Certainly it holds up a lot more convincingly than the arcade title it purports to translate into console form. This is one of those strange cases where a console game and an arcade game sharing the same title landed around the same time, but frankly seem to have very little to do with one another, something we'll see again when Strider stumbles its way to NES later in 89. In this case, Ninja Gaiden debuted in American arcades in October 1988, just a couple of months before the Famicom cartridge hit stores in Japan. The coin-op then seemingly hit Japanese game centers right around the same time that the Japanese retail release made its appearance. In Japan, both iterations shipped under the name Ninja Ryukenden, roughly Ninja Dragon Sword Legend, and told the story of a masked assassin by the name of Ryu who punches his way through the streets of America under the employ of the US government in a quest to stop a madman from launching nukes in order to fulfill Nostradamus's supposed apocalyptic millennial prophecies. If you squint a bit and let your vision blur, you can see how this lines up with the NES game, but only in the loosest form imaginable. Inexplicably retitled Ninja Gaiden for the US, demoting Ryu's adventure from legend to side story, the NES game's iteration has almost nothing to do whatsoever with the arcade title. There's a guy named Ryu who goes to America, sure, and both the US government and an apocalyptic cult factor in. Otherwise, though, you'd have a hell of a time trying to pick one game as the other in a police lineup. This, of course, was nothing new for publisher Tecmo. Although Capcom seems to have garnered the highest profile reputation for reworking its arcade games into unrecognizable mutant forms for the NES, Tecmo really pioneered that space nearly two years prior to the debut of Ninja Gaiden with Rygar and Mighty Bomb Jack. Not entirely unlike Ninja Gaiden, the Rygar coin-op played as a fairly mindless barbarian action title that saw a beefy dude running left to right for dozens of stages, hitting monsters repeatedly with a weapon that resembled a large frisbee on an elastic chain. Rygar and NES retained the beefy guy and the death yo-yo, and even some superficial visual elements like the iconic sunset background, but otherwise took on a form better suited to consoles. Given that the NES hardware couldn't replicate the visual punch of that arcade board, Tecmo overhauled it to focus more on substance than the superficial. It became a non-linear adventure, a free-roaming journey through a variety of different environments linked by hub spaces that involved a perspective change akin to Hudson's Challenger or Falcom's Xanadu. Ninja Gaiden on NES doesn't reinvent the coin-op's core gameplay quite that dramatically. Reflecting the trends of its time, it takes a more linear, action-oriented approach. As Metroidvania Works viewers know, exploratory action games had just begun to hit their stride on the American NES, yet nearly all of the proto-Metroidvania games arriving in the States throughout 1989 and into 90 made their original debut in Japan throughout 1988 and even as early as 1987. The tides and trends of game design had begun to push away from adventures that blur genre lines into more rigid, traditional forms, and Ninja Gaiden offered some of the purest, most intense console-style action ever seen. The arcade game played out as a brawler in the Double Dragon mode, an early entrant in the genre that would almost completely dominate game centers in 1989, with the arrival of Final Fight, X-Men, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and so on. But the brawler would be a little slower to find its footing on consoles, perhaps understandably, given the compromises involved in bringing the likes of Renegade and Double Dragon to NES. So Tecmo went with a more people-pleasing approach. 
For once, this doesn't appear to be a side effect of Nintendo's famous declaration that NES versions of multi-platform games needed to be substantially different from those on other systems. For starters, that mandate seems to have been somewhat exaggerated in the telling, given the way that arcade conversions like Qbert and Galaga played more or less exactly the same as they did on competing platforms of the era. But even more tellingly, the NES interpretation of Ninja Gaiden, or something extremely similar in form to it, also showed up on TurboGrafx-16 and Master System. Those admittedly came later, but in the bigger picture, we effectively have Ninja Gaiden existing as two wildly different interpretations of a single concept, which is to say a CIA-powered ninja stopping the apocalypse. It's not entirely unlike, I don't know, the novel versus television versus radio presentations of the later chapters of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm sure that media property was front of mind for Tecmo's designers as they worked on this. Anyway, speaking of designers, three key personnel spring immediately to mind when it comes to this version of Ninja Gaiden. First, you had composer Keiji Yamagishi, who penned an interesting soundtrack consisting primarily of short, repetitive loops. Under any other circumstance, Yamagishi's work here might be more irritating than enjoyable, but the Ninja Gaiden soundtrack has two things going for it. First, just about every track sounds great, making clever use of the console's sampling channel to deliver live-sounding percussion one of the first instances we've seen of this composition technique on NES. Secondly, the repetition perfectly underscores the urgency of the action, which moves at a faster pace than, honestly, anything we've seen to date on this console. More complex or nuanced compositions would only distract here. Ninja Gaiden throws so much at you so quickly that you need the music to take a simple propulsive form to help you focus. We can attribute the relentless speed of the action to director Hideo Yoshizawa, a sophomore game designer who would go on to lead a ton of top flight projects at Namco, including Ridge Racer Type 4, Klonoa, and of course, Mr. Driller. Yoshizawa designed a game almost but not entirely unlike the arcade title bearing the same name as this cartridge. Where the coin-op had the slow, measured pace of a brawler, which forced players to stop every few steps to slowly deal with groups of thugs who could soak up tons of punishment before going down, Ninja Gaiden on NES practically punished anyone who didn't maintain a brisk run throughout. And I mean that literally. A programming quirk causes enemies to reappear infinitely if their spawn point lands in the 8 pixel tiles bordering either side of the screen, meaning that bad guys can materialize again the instant you strike them down infinitely. Yoshizawa's guiding principle for Ninja Gaiden's action boils down to rhythm. The game puts you in control of a young ninja named Ryu Hayabusa, who commands a limited but versatile set of actions. Ryu can run and jump, as one might expect, and he wields a sword that lashes out quickly and has a very generous hitbox. He can make use of other abilities as well, but the core of Ninja Gaiden primarily boils down to Ryu running, jumping, and slashing. Enemies appear around each level, having been placed with loving care to force players to contend with multiple threats on every screen. But notably, the foes you face here are almost always placed in ways that seem like cheap shots at first, guaranteed to land unavoidable free hits against Ryu, but whose placement and behavior works in careful synchronization with the flow of the stage layouts and the appearance of other enemies. Ninja Gaiden for NES has sometimes been likened to Castlevania, and that's not entirely off the mark. Although it moves a lot faster, and Ryu is far more nimble than any Belmont ever dreamed, both games operate under a common design ethos. Precision action based around the protagonist's skills and body. Everything that Ninja Gaiden throws at you can be slashed or evaded if you know what's coming, and grasp the controls for Ryu's skills. This does mean that Ninja Gaiden does require a bit of trial and error as you learn the patterns and timing of the threats that you have to overcome, but it always feels manageable. There's a flow here that calls to mind Super Mario Bros. Adventure Island in Castlevania, but Tecmo ratcheted up the intensity a few steps to create the briskest action title yet seen on NES. The game doesn't reward dawdling, and taking the time to backtrack or climb walls to reach power-ups you've missed presents a serious risk that you'll bring more damage upon yourself by working backward against enemy spawns designed around the assumption that you're moving forward rather than backward. Incidentally, it's probably worth mentioning that power-ups appear when you destroy slashable objects affixed to the walls of each stage, just like Castlevania's candles. The level setups can lead to some intensely frustrating moments. Flying enemies like birds tend to approach from oblique angles that require you to leap and slash with perfect, predictive timing, which makes them incredibly dangerous, especially when paired with other foes, like soldiers who fire strings of projectiles. 
To make matters even more obnoxious, Ryu's period of invincibility after taking damage lasts about as long as his knockback recoil. This means that a single bad hit can result in you ping-ponging back and forth between enemies, helpless to move or fight back, which might even compound with the overly enthusiastic enemy spawn mechanics to escalate the situation into something worse than the setup that sent you reeling in the first place. But to its credit, Ninja Gaiden has fairly short levels and decidedly generous checkpointing. Getting wiped out by a cheap enemy ambush is never not frustrating, but at the same time you can get back to the point where you died in a matter of seconds, so it rarely feels like a huge setback. On top of that, Ryu does have a few abilities to lean on beyond jumping and slashing. For starters, he can cling to the wall, a power put to excellent effect later in 1989 by the arcade version of Strider and utterly botched by the NES version of Strider. Although fundamentally used as Ryu's answer to the Belmont's abilities to climb stairs, that is, scrambling up the ladders that link different levels of the spaces he invades, the wall cling also works on most bare walls. Technically, Ryu can only climb on designated ladders. On other vertical surfaces, he can hang to the wall or column as long as you like, but he can't move except by jumping. However, a little finger finesse allows him to work his way up bare walls by kicking off from a wall and rapidly pushing back toward it grasping the surface at a slightly higher point than he leapt from. While he's largely defenseless during a wall cling, Ryu can use his alternate weapons. Yes, in true Belmont fashion, Ryu can acquire different secondary powers that expand his arsenal beyond simple sword strikes. Not only does he acquire these from the candle stand-ins he finds along the way, but he also needs to collect spirit power-ups in order to use them. Think Castlevania's hearts, but with more kanji. Ryu's alt weapons include a tiny shuriken which flies straight ahead weakly like Simon Belmont's dagger. There's also the Windmill Star, a massive shuriken that passes through enemies and flies back again, kind of like Castlevania's boomerang, except that rather than doubling back along a straight line, this star attempts to fly back to Ryu and will continue to wheel around in space and clear out bad guys for as long as you manage to hop out of its way. Less excitingly, he can acquire a spinning jump akin to Samus Aran's screw attack, a tool that burns through his spirit points every time he attacks in midair, unless you know to cancel it out by holding down the d-pad as you attack. While useful in places, the spin attack is expensive, though holding on to it until you reach a boss turns most of them into trivial jokes. Finally, in addition to temporary invincibility and invisibility, Ryu can acquire something called the Art of Fire, a power that sends a spinning trio of fireballs flying upward at a 45 degree angle and can be absolutely invaluable when dealing with flying foes or just a dude aggressively patrolling an overhead space you need to travel to. The Art of Fire also tends to shred most bosses and is more or less mandatory if you hope to have a chance against the final boss trio. In a way, Ninja Gaiden predicts modern day speedruns and masochist platformers like Super Meat Boy. A world record unassisted speedrun of Ninja Gaiden doesn't actually look all that much different than a normal playthrough by an experienced fan. The relative generosity of the game's death penalties gives you a chance to practice and perfect each stage for a few, or a few dozen attempts, until you work out the patterns. It's a welcome contrast to the more usual approach of the era, one frequently seen on Master System in particular. You know, giving you three lives and no continues and forcing you to slog repeatedly through the opening levels for a brief shot at figuring out the later stages before dying and starting all over again. And it's not like the average person was just blasting through Ninja Gaiden on a weekend rental, in part because of the one infamous exception to the game's gentle checkpoint setup. When you die against the final boss, you go back to the beginning of that world. Not the beginning of the current level, 6-3, but rather back to the point immediately after the previous boss, the start of 6-1. Supposedly this originally came about as the result of a programming glitch, but the developers loved it so much that they canonized it as part of the final code. It's a weirdly unkind choice given that stage 6-2 of Ninja Gaiden is one of the most profoundly difficult levels ever seen in a video game, a non-stop assault of every possible hazard all thrown at you simultaneously, a brutal gauntlet that demands not only perfect memorization of every detail, but also perfect execution of your plan of attack in order to clear it. But at least the game does offer infinite continues. And there is another incentive to keep you playing. The story. We take video game narratives for granted these days, but back in 1989, the idea seemed downright remarkable, at least in the American console space. 
And even for those accustomed to plot-driven games like Infocom text adventures, Sierra graphical adventures, computer role-playing games, or even something like NES Rambo, where reaching plot milestones would open up new areas or change the nature of the environment, Ninja Gaiden still stood out. Here we can credit the third key figure in the game's development, illustrator Masato Kato. In arcades, each new stage of Ninja Gaiden opened with a small still image of Ryu's journey. Kato and his team took this grain of visual interest and expanded it to become literally half of the NES version's entire content. Ryu's journey on NES spans the Americas, just as in arcades, and he still ends up working with the US government to try to stop the machinations of a doomsday cult. But where the coin-op adventure is content to simply show you where Ryu will be beating up dudes next, the NES version goes into great detail about why he's going through all of this trouble in the first place. The storyline isn't exactly classical literature, but it's not meant to be. No, Ninja Gaiden wears its influences on its sleeves, or lack of sleeves in Ryu's case. Specifically, Japanese manga. Kato presents the story through illustrated panels accompanied by dialogue, but his artwork also takes advantage of the dynamic nature of the medium to introduce elements of motion. The result is one of the first instances of what today we would call a motion comic, creating the illusion of animation through simple manipulation of still images. Kato's artwork takes the visual motion elements of manga, such as the panel framing and speed lines and the rapid cuts, then translates them back into a moving medium. It's not full animation, something that would be an impossibility given the volume of art present here versus the cramped storage space of an NES cart, but it's more than mere manga. Each panel takes up a tiny bit of screen real estate, but thanks to Kato's excellently modeled artwork and deft direction, you don't really notice that the illustrations only occupy a minuscule window. The closest thing the NES had managed to Ninja Gaiden's approach to storytelling to this point had been Golgo 13, where the protagonist would occasionally walk out to have a static, typically one-sided conversation with another character. There was nothing static about Ninja Gaiden's cutscenes, though. Through quick perspective changes and even simple color manipulation tricks, the game managed to convey the energetic spirit of anime. There's some genuinely solid storyboarding here with interesting angles, clear conversational shifts, and an effective use of shadows and dramatic lighting to allow the pools of black to compensate for the console's limited color capacity and minute storage space. Ninja Gaiden's cutscenes often use simple techniques to create movement and mood, like the subtle palette cycling that suggests a mysterious woman stepping out of the shadows without involving any actual motion. Admittedly, some of the more ponderous information dumps, especially the CIA's lengthy slideshow about the evil demon at the crux of the plot, tend to drag on, and the 20 plus minutes of cutscenes contained throughout Ninja Gaiden could probably have been trimmed to about half that with a speedier text display and less nattering on about ancient statues. But these complaints seem petty in the context of the era, especially since you could easily skip any cutscene by simply pressing the start button. Ninja Gaiden turned the NES into a thrilling storytelling tool like nothing before it, and complaining that some of the scenes were a little boring is a little like complaining that someone gave you the wrong brand of bottled water after rescuing you from a week stranded in the desert. Ninja Gaiden took the arcade game's premise of a ninja fighting weirdos in America and expanded it into something meaty enough to stand on its own as a 45-minute anime OAV. The game begins by sending Ryu on an overseas journey when he receives a letter from his seemingly deceased father. But even before that, we see Ryu's father fall in combat in the midst of a classic ninja sword duel by Moonlight. Along the way, Ryu meets a mysterious woman, learns terrible truths from a friend of his father's, falls under the influence of the CIA, and eventually comes face to face with the cult leader and his minions. The action sequences lead directly into cutscenes from the very start. The first stage ends with Ryu battling a massive, axe-wielding bruiser called Barbarian. This launches immediately into a cinematic in which Ryu contemplates the hordes of street boxers and dogmen he's just murdered in cold blood on the merciless streets of Manhattan only to be knocked unconscious by a woman who greets him in a jail cell upon his recovery, hands him a strange statue, and sets him free. From here, Ryu enters stage two, where he begins at the door to his former cell and escapes from a seemingly military or industrial compound. The experience alternates like this from here, with each set of action levels leading to a cutscene that sets the stage for the next collection of levels. The promise of more story and cool manga-style graphics makes for a compelling carrot as the game beats you with a stick of its vicious level designs. And some of the cutscenes aren't about the story, they're just there to look cool. Once Ryu makes his way through the jungles of South America to the villain's lair, you're rewarded with a brief, full-screen scene of Ryu looking up at the bizarre castle in the distance, which, unsurprisingly, 
will remind you of Castlevania's ending dialed up to 11. Should you actually manage the feat of completing the game, the capsule collapses in an even more direct Castlevania parallel, but not before Ryu's dying father bids him farewell in a direct homage to the end of The Empire Strikes Back and our hero professes his love to the mysterious woman he just met despite the fact that she's a CIA agent who shot him in a bar. Ninja Gaiden's story is about 20% narrative cohesion and about 80% vibes, and to be frank, a console game had never vibed this intensely before. Sure, you can point to the shortcomings here, and you wouldn't be wrong. The aggressive enemy respawn behavior, the wildly unfair penalty for game overing against the final boss, the stilted translation that absolutely tortures boss names like Cerberus and Mars and Berserker into something unrecognizable, the more tiresome plot dumps, it's not perfect. But Ninja Gaiden brought a new kind of gameplay to NES, the unflinchingly bestial difficulty of Ghosts and Goblins offset by the considered precision of Castlevania. Then it presented all of that with the coolest looking package imaginable. Ninja Gaiden style cutscenes would become a standard fixture of NES games, though frankly very few developers managed to rival, let alone top, Tecmo's work here. The motion manga approach would truly flourish on CD-based 16-bit consoles, becoming the standard for video game narratives until the full-screen movie transitions of Final Fantasy VII pushed the medium toward a more seamless, film-like standard. In other words, Ninja Gaiden was kind of a big deal, and it would survive in various forms for another 20 years or so. And you'd better believe that Nintendo Power recognized Ninja Gaiden's appeal. After teasing the game in a breathless, hype-addled advanced preview, the magazine made it the cover feature for issue 5. That spread devoted a whopping 11 pages to laying out the details of Ninja Gaiden's mechanics and its first three stages. The following issue then gave stages 4 and 5 another 8 pages of coverage, effectively taking players step by step up to the final level. Ninja Gaiden remained a fixture of the magazine in the following months, constantly appearing near the top of the reader, retailer, and editor selected top 30 rankings for the remainder of 1989, while popping up from time to time in the various tips and tricks sections. On the Famicom side of things, it doesn't seem to have fared nearly as well as on NES, given that Japanese audiences seem less enamored with all things ninja than American kids were in the 80s. But Tecmo did find reason to create two sequels, rebrand a competitor's name under the name Ninja Gaiden, and even create a grim, joyless anime sequel to the games, bringing things full circle in a way. Next time on NES Works, pack your swim trunks and maybe a dagger, because we're headed to Crystal Lake.